Hello all, welcome to Scientifica 2022 once again. Now we have a talk on pediatric shoulder instability by Nana Tokes. Before we do that, we have a moderator for the session today, Dr. Sona Kolke. She is an associate professor at Sanjeevi Institute College of Physiotherapy in Pune. She is specialized in musculoskeletal physiotherapy and currently is pursuing her PhD as well. Over to you, Dr. Sona. A very good evening. Uh, I'm sure the two days of scientific deliberation and talks by eminent physiotherapists in India, as well as all around the globe, has been enjoyed by our delegates in these two days. As we move towards the fact end, I have the privilege of introducing yet another noteworthy physiotherapist for the talk on pediatric shoulder instability, that is Dr. Nana Tokes. Dr. Nana Tokes qualified as a physiotherapist from the Sheffield Hillam University in 2002 and completed her master's in 2015 in first class. She's a member of the British Elbow and Shoulder Society and was awarded the BESS Traveling Fellowship in 2015. She has presented both locally as well as nationally and is involved in research projects within the NHS. She has co-authored a chapter in an orthopedic textbook on shoulder assessment and is involved in research established in peer-reviewed journals. She did her basic training at the Sheffield Teaching Hospital Trust before specializing in musculoskeletal physiotherapy in 2005. She had the opportunity to gain experience across numerous specialities before deciding to focus on the upper limb and became an upper limb extended scope physiotherapist in 2012 at Chesterfield Royal Hospital and continues to do so till date. She has worked in private practice at a White House clinic in Sheffield as well as the Children's Sheffield Hospital. She has assessed and treated a wide variety of upper limb conditions, both pre- and post-operatively, with special interest in assessment and management of shoulder instability, structural as well as non-structural, both in children and adults, with an additional experience in the management of chronic pain. Ma'am, I hand over the session to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to uh, share my screen now. I'll start the presentation. So I'm going to present on the unstable pediatric shoulder and give a brief overview of what we see in clinical practice in the UK from a traumatic through to a, a traumatic point of view. So my aims are to briefly outline the functional anatomy of the shoulder girdle, to give an overview of the types of pediatric shoulder instability and and how to assess and manage these patients. So first, a brief revision of functional anatomy of the shoulder. It's a complex joint that's inherently unstable. It is a large ball on a relatively small socket and is deepened by approximately one third by the glenoid labrum, which acts as a chop block to keep the humeral head congruent with, with the glenoid. The static constraints include the capsule, which is quite capacious. The ligamentous restraints include in the superior, middle and inferior glenohumeral humeral ligaments. The dynamic restraints provide dynamic stability and include the rotator cuff muscles and deltoid, along with the long head of biceps, which acts as a compressor and an anterior stabilizer. Just wanted to give you a reminder of the muscles surrounding the upper body. I will particularly focus on the rotator cuff For the purpose of the talk, you will hear me refer to the posterior rotator cuff, which is inferin supraspinatus, and the anterior rotator cuff, which is subscapularis. I will also consider the motor muscles, uh, such as latissimus dorsi, which is a powerful glenohumeral humeral joint external rotator, and pectoralis major and deltoid. So the unstable shoulder. So we see a mixture of atraumatic and traumatic shoulder instability in our clinics. And I wanted to touch upon what we are actually looking at in terms of the pediatric and stable shoulder and the importance of thorough history taking and subsequent examination. I'm just going to show a couple of videos and just to get you thinking about things. So the first one, you may just see that little pop at the end of range. This is a really common thing we see in clinic. I'll just play that again. And the second one is a little more unusual. 
you can see the movement is quite uncontrolled but we'll come back to these a little later So in terms of assessment, it is considering what key subjective and objective markers are, what is re relevant to the unstable shoulder in terms of the information you want from the patient, and when do you need to consider sending for investigations or consultant opinion, and how do you rehabilitate based on your assessment findings, and when do you need to consider a multidisciplinary team approach. So the first thing is to define whether the, you have a truly unstable shoulder or is it one that is lax. Laxity is a physiological and asymptomatic shoulder. Joint laxity is the degree of glenohumeral translation, which falls within the physical, physiological range and does not cause pain or apprehension. Instability is abnormal and pathological and produces symptoms such as pain and or instability. Classification of shoulder instability is very difficult and there is no consensus. However, I would advise you to consider firstly etiology. Has there been a history of trauma such as a fall or during playing sport? Or is there no clear history of trauma? Did they just start to pop and dislocate the shoulder? And they don't have any history of injury. Severity of the subluxation or dislocation. Does it just pop in and out and doesn't cause any symptoms and is more of an annoyance? Has it dislocated on one occasion and they've had to come to hospital to have it relocated? Is there radiological evidence of any dislocation? And the severity of symptoms at the time of incidence, did they have lots of associated pain and disability afterwards or did it merely pop in and out and they got going? The history, so how long have they had the dislocations for? Have they been dislocating for years? Or have they presented in your clinic one or two weeks after a dislocation during a sporting injury? And then it's how frequently it occurs. Is it a one or two off occasion? Or is it every time they move their arm? Is it related to sport or more innocuous activities? And associated symptoms, so do they get any pain? Is it mainly apprehension? Is it more an annoyance because it's clicking in and out? Any locking sensations, which may indicate long head of biceps pathology and any associated neuropathic pain? Also the effect on their function or sport, and is there any? So volition, how well they can control or uncontrol the dislocations. Can they voluntarily dislocate, for example, a party trick or a habit, or does it happen spontaneously? Also think about whether the joint is falling out, for example, on, on rest or on moving, so being pulled out. And did it start off as a party trick as a child and then become uncontrollable? So in the UK, we refer to the Stanmore Triangle Classification, which was devised by the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital. This classifies shoulder instability into three polar types. Type one, which refers to the shoulders that have had a history of trauma and have underlying structural pathology. Type two, which is atraumatic or microtrauma, but they do also have a structural pathology present. And polar type three, which is a muscle, abnormal muscle patterning related shoulder instability, that when you look inside the shoulder, there's absolutely no structural problem. Patients can move from polar pipe type one into type three, for example, they may have a sporting injury and develop a structural lesion and then start to develop abnormal muscle patterning around the shoulder. I will now go into the specific types of shoulder instability in more detail. So type one is the most common and accounts for 95% of all shoulder dislocations. The key is there is a key history of trauma with an associated injury or fall onto an outstretched arm and a higher incidence in collision sports such as rugby or football. The patient will describe a clear history of shoulder dislocation associated with severe pain and will either need it relocating pitch side or need to attend the ED for relocation. Typically, these patients will have radiological evidence of shoulder dislocation and it's often associated with a structural lesion such as a hill sacs fracture or label pathology. If polar type 1 and acute, there's often no abnormal muscle patterning and it often happens on one side. Children will normally regain movements of the shoulder within a couple of weeks following a true dislocation and may report no pain, but will still need physiotherapy rehab to avoid future dislocations. In males aged 15 to 19, there is a very high chance of re-dislocation. Type two is atraumatic shoulder instability. They may have minor structural pathology and type two and three are generally much harder to identify 
and account for around 5% of shoulder instability. Subtle instabilities may occur in the overhead athletes, such as cricking, cricket, bowler, bowling and swimming. It's uni, unilateral, but in the, ca in the case of the dominant throwing arm, and there may be some dysfunction, such as hyperlaxity. There is no abnormal muscle patterning in the polar type 2. The type 3 instability is atraumatic, so there's no history of trauma. Presentation may come over a period of time, and the child may notice a non-painful clicking or popping initially, or starting with a dislocation during a party trick. The most common age of presentation we see is around 12 to 14, with an associated onset of pu puberty and growth spurts, which may increase symptoms of dynamic-related shoulder instability around the shoulder. Inside, there is no structural pathology, and all investigations will be normal. And there is evidence of abnormal muscle patterning, and they will may, may be present with bilateral symptoms, often associated with underlying joint hyperlaxity. So the key subjective questions I like to ask is if there is any presence or absence of trauma, and this is the first ever episode. If there was a history of trauma, then this would increase my index of suspicion of any of structural damage. Is there a voluntary or an involuntary history? For example, children I see will start dislocating as a party trick, but then it becomes involuntary over time. Do they have any other symptomatic joints, such as hips dislocating or knees in dislocating, indicating some joint hyperlaxity? The age of onset around puberty, as we discussed before, and their sporting background. So do they do throwing sports or collision sports? Have they changed their in, in, um, intensity of activities? Have they started to do more activity or reduce what they're doing? Also consider social uh, factors, such as family dynamics, school, have they had time off school? Has there been any bullying at school? And is there any pattern to the dislocations regarding school versus weekends? This would make me think about other drivers for the dislocations, especially in the type three, and any psychological issues such as anxiety, depression, and mental health problems. So symptoms which are characteristic of shoulders dislocation, the direction of dislocation is very difficult to establish. The majority of type one dislocators will be anterior in direction, posterior is much rarer, whereas a large portion of the type three dislocations will be posterior in direction, but sometimes they can be multi-directional. Does, the, does the patient have pain? Often I find children don't have pain, it's just subluxing and more an inconvenience. If there is associated pain or neuropathic pain, this would my, increase my suspicion of other drivers, which I'll discuss later or even the possibility of an underlying structural pathology, but not always. The frequency of the dislocations, are they infrequent? Did it just happen once or is it all the time? And then the impact on their life, have they stopped doing PE? Is there fear around the dislocations, either from the child or the family? And the school's reactions to the dislocations, have they stopped them doing PE or do they just let them carry on? And then the impact on their social life, or does the child just get on with everything in spite of the dislocation? <clears throat> so there's lack of consensus on which patient reported outcome measure to use. We use the Oxford Instability Score um, at my practice, but there is an overall lack of consensus. So I will discuss how we look at a general shoulder examination, then go into more detail of how to assess the different types of shoulder instability using a few tips and tricks I use in clinical practice. Firstly, I observe how the child moves from walking into the department, move, removing clothes and willingness to move the upper limb. I observe for any postural changes, muscle weight, wasting, hypertonic muscles, spinal asymmetries such as scoliosis and kyphosis. Palpate the clavicle and the AC joint and for any sensitive areas or hyperalgesia. I'll also assess the auxiliary nerve function and document, which is particularly important if you've had a history of traumatic shoulder dislocation to look for associated nerve injury. I look at range of movement, including the range itself, and then also the quality and willingness to move and look for any evidence of abnormal muscle patterning around the shoulder girdle. I'll also test strength, which I'll go through in more detail, and assess for laxity in around the shoulder. If I have identified any abnormal muscle patterning, I will then see if I can improve the patient's symptoms and instability within the treatment session. So just to briefly test on the rotator cuff, it's hard to def definitely say which muscles we are testing. It's a strength test less specificity. However, we can say we are hoping to bias more of the anterior or posterior rotator cuff muscles and build up a picture of the patient's issues. I would look at external rotation in neutral. 
full can test, empty can test, and then to test the subscapularis, that's the image on the right, you can do Gerber's lift off, belly press and bear hug. I'll also assess the rotator cuff more dynamically, which I'll go through later in more detail. So for a structural pathology, which is looking at the type one, we're trying to screen for any signs of label pathology. We think of the glenoid like a clock face with the top being the superior position and the bottom being the inferior portion. The anterior superior position is at the front and the posterior superior is at the back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Surgeons will document this in the occupation, uh, sorry, op operative notes in the UK. For example, the labrum is damaged from four o'clock to seven o'clock. And we try and stress different parts of the label with our clinical tests. So first to mention is Gage's hyperabduction test. Normal shoulders, you would have around 100 to 105 degrees of hyperabduction. In a hyperlax shoulder, this may increase to 140, but would be noted bilaterally. In a pathological shoulder with inferior label pathology, there will be an increase in hyperabduction plus or minus apprehension. Apprehension relocation will assess for anterior instability, and you would take the shoulder into 90 degrees in external rotation. And if the a positive response would be apprehension, but not pain, which is then reduced when an AP pressure is applied, and that may indicate a Bankart lesion. If a, pa <coughs> excuse me. if a patient is a type three muscle partner, apprehension relocation would be negative. They may have a positive bilateral gauges sign. For posterior instability, we use the Kim's chest and the jerk test, which loads the posterior aspect of the labrum and may produce a click, a pop, instability or pain. And then we use the O'Brien's test in clinic because it's easy in, to use to assess the long head of biceps. In physio practice, I'll also use the bicep to load two, pain provocation and crank test just to increase my um, uh, diagnostic clinical tests. So just to consider instability versus laxity. So laxity you can assess with Baton's score, the Silker's sign, Gage's test, which is bilateral hyperabduction. You can also have a look for the shoulder hyperlaxity score, which is out of three. This includes the Gage's test and whether you have an excess of 90 degrees external rotation in neutral and then into abduction. Instability, on the other hand, is looking at the structural tests that we've just described. So to recap, the first image is a sulcus sign, and then Baton's score is a score out of nine, looking at little finger hyperflexion, and then thumb, elbow, knee, and hands to floor. So I'm just going to go through a type one case study. So this was a 14-year-old girl who fell and dislocated her shoulder while skiing, which is relocated to slope side. Rehab in the UK, we couldn't get the girl get back to play netball and she was feeling over apprehensive with doing overhead passes. In clinic, she had a positive apprehension and relocation test and a positive slap test and was sent for an MR gram, which diagnosed a slap and a bank cart tear. There was no underlying hyperlaxity. She had full range of movements, but was unable to play sports and was apprehensive into abduction external rotation. So investigations to consider would be EMG or nerve conduction studies to rule out any associated nerve injury, which was not the case with her. An MR arthrogram to assess for any soft tissue structural damage. A CTA wasn't necessary as there was no sign of any bony injury on the x-ray. And then finally an arthros arthroscopy, which she had. She then had an arthroscopic repair of the slap and of the bank art. She was in sling for four weeks, had protected range of movement for six weeks, and then she had supervised strengthening from six to 12, and she was returned to contact sports from six months. Just a, a little note about a surgeon's perspective and what we see in Sheffield. Pre-pandemic conversion to surgery for sh shoulder instability was quite low with 20 cases over five years. If surgery is offered, it's normally in the skeletally mature sporting age group of around age to 15 to 18. And the key is don't rule out structural pathology, even if there is associated hyperlaxity. So a type two case study was a 14 year old competitive swimmer 
with a 12 month history of right wrist and left shoulder pain. She'd had no change in her training, but prior to the onset of the pain, but had stopped swimming now because of pain. He did have a growth spurt around 12 months ago and was now five foot 11 at the age of 14. <clears throat> On clinical examination, she had a poking chin posture with bilateral winging of her scapula. Shoulders had three out of three score for hyperlaxity, although Baton's score was naught out of nine and slap test were positive. She was functionally weak through her rotator cuff and upper traps and had generally poor course, poor course stability. The rehab looked mainly at her swimming train frequency and looking at her core stability, scapular control and rotator cuff control through range. After three months, her shoulder pain had much improved and she decided she didn't want to go back to her swimming, but had decided to start coaching instead. This is just an example of a, a video of something we might do with a type two instability. So I was using the bands just to help get his upper traps and rotator cuff to work. I tried an anterior and a posterior direction of the, the bands and his he had the most symptom relief with the um, anterior to posterior direction, which just helped to facilitate his cuff and upper trapezius and gave him a full shoulder range of movement. It's just an example of what we might do in clinic. So objective tips and tricks for a type three. So how do you identify an abnormal muscle patterning and can you change it? Half the battle of is identifying what you can see. I will also assess the patient's core stability. Poor core stability can influence the superficial torque action of the larger global muscles, such as latissimus dorsi or pet major, and this can result in poor glenohumeral joint control. I would look at Kibler's corkscrew test, which I have a video of in a minute, and general function examination. So for example, how well they can perform a sit, sit up, a step up, a sit to stand, a bridging action, looking at their lumbo-pelvic control and any abnormal compensatory movement. Developmental tests, this is looking for any delays in motor, uh, motor control from childhood. And this is based on some of the work that Joe Gibson's done from Liverpool. She might look at the angels in the snow test, which is essentially getting the child on the floor and looks at the movement of the upper and lower limbs, the differentiation between the two and how coordinated the movements are, making sure there's no associated movements, any hesitancy, and if the child needs to look at the limb whilst they're performing the movements. I may use this as part of the assessment if the parent mentions any delays in the child meeting milestones, such as not crawling through their arms, they may have started commando crawling or going straight to standing, not riding a bike, difficulty chewing, uh, tying shoelaces, over any clumsiness playing sport or associated uh, dyspraxia or dyslexia. So the first video is how I might assess the rotate cuff more dynamically. So I'd get the patient in prone, the upper limbs supported and get them to externally and medially rotate in abduction and assess the strength of the anterior and posterior rotator cuff through range. I'd also have a look at what the scapula is doing and if there's any compensatory movement and how easily they can move the limb and compare side to side. The next video is just a, a demonstration of Kibler's corkscrew test. This was our student and he actually had quite poor control over the left side, as you can see, just gives a good idea of overall proximal and trunk stability, which then may influence the shoulder. So movement, so observing for any abnormal movement patterning. First, you would ask the child to flex their elbow. Are their pecs activating, which they shouldn't be? If you then ask them to flex the shoulder, pec major may be more active even to the extent the shoulder will dislocate, or they may appear stiff. Have a feel of like what lat dorsi is doing, as overactivity can give perceived stiffness into flexion. I don't think I've ever seen a truly stiff child who's hypermobile or unstable. Have a look at shoulder external rotation, palpate and observe for lat dorsi overactivity. If this is noted, get them to stand on one leg. And does their trunk flex, flex to one side, indicating that the lat dorsi is not stable, stabilizing the trunk, but fixing the shoulder. If you think back to the original video with the girl with the very abnormal movement patterning, I moved her arm to see what, whether she was clamping it to the side. Patients who are lat dorsi dominant will 
typically fixed their limb to the side and it's very difficult to get you to re release, release it and you can feel it kicking in. You may see if you can consciously unclamp their arm to externally rotate and if they're still fixing, get them in supine with lots of support and work on external rotation control using of the glenohumeral joint using the rotator cuff and not latissimus dorsi. So tips and tricks. Firstly, you should do the movement or the strength test, which brings on the symptoms or highlights the instability or the humeral head subluxing. You can then correct either the scapula or the humeral head position. If, for example, if the scapula is winging, the glenohumeral joint can posterior sublux, does altering the scapula position by forming an upward rotation or a scapular shrug improve the glenohumeral joint movement, or does activating the posterior rotator cuff by reducing pec, ma made, sorry, pec major activity, or simply by activating the posterior rotator cuff to reduce posterior shoulder dislocation. You can get this to get the patient to externally rotate and raise their arm or use the theraband or your hand to, re to resist. It's trying to establish whether it's glean humeral joint driven instability or whether the scapula is at fault. You can also use the kinetic chain to activate the posterior rotator cuff, prevent trunk side flexion and uh, thoracic side flexion. So these are just some examples of how a patient might move. So the first one is to they might lift their arms in medial rotation. This can cause the pet major to activate and the shoulder can dislocate in this position. This is a demonstration of what I might do in practice just to get them to kind of correct their scapular position and get some upward rotation of the scapula and thorax, which again is sometimes enough to get the posterior cuff to activate and prevent the dislocation. So I just do the simple stuff first. The second video shows what I might do to get the cuff working. So it incorporates the kinetic chain, gets the glutes firing, and is a proprioceptively rich exercise. And that is, can often get them to stop dislocating. So type three common patterns of um, the positions are generally where the pec major will pull the shoulder anteriorly or the latissimus dorsi will pull it posteriorly. I'm more worried if I see the first picture, which is where the shoulder is out at rest. This is much rarer. These are just some x-rays of what it might look to kind of anteriorly sublux, but not truly dislocate. And this is the most common pattern that I would see in clinical practice of a type three. And essentially, if we're going back to the original video, this is an involuntary posterior dislocator. So as she raises her arm up, you can just see there the shoulders kind of being in and out. So it's not a true full dislocation, but she's just subluxing in and out. So this is a typical case study I might see. So a 16 year old college student came to see me with a three year history of right shoulder pain and popping, no trauma and start to get tingling in the little finger and hand. They were, had various bits of physio, they couldn't find what was wrong, eventually went to A&E with pain and had six months of physio for the neck, which was worsening. Essentially, when they came to see me, they were posterior subluxing and it hadn't been picked up on and they were just getting some occipital tunnel type symptoms. So on clinical examination, they had a slim build, poking chin posture, they had full shoulder range of movement, but they were dislocating their posterior, posteriorly at the glenohumeral joint. They had base and score of six out of nine and shoulder hyperlaxity of three out of three. Best in the rotator cuff power was good, they just didn't activate it. So this is not the patient, this is similar to what I do. So essentially all I've got this girl to do is lift with her hands in external rotation, which switches on the, on the posterior cuff and her shoulder doesn't dislocate anymore. So these patients can be really quick and there you go, she's lifted in medial rotation and it's out again. So these are just some rehab ideas that I might use to really get the posterior cuff working. It uses uh, the kinetic chain, really dynamic exercises. Kids really like them. And a child that dislocates raising their arms, if you get them in this position, they won't dislocate. So it can be really empowering for the child. It can reinforce um, that they can move without it dislocating. It's really good for fear avoidance. This is part of the Derby instability program that we use, which is a, the first exercise is a drop and catch. 
So it's working on proprioception and joint position control. This one I call a Superman, but it's essentially getting the posterior chain to work. So it's really good for firing up glutes and the posterior cuff again. And again, they do, they, the kids don't dislocate in this position. So I just get them doing lots of this as their home exercise program. The ball behind them gives them some proprioceptive input into their thorax. Again, it's just re lots of reinforcement of a normal movement pattern. That's kind of the basis for the rehab. So drivers for abnormal muscle pattern include a growth spurt, hyperlactity, any associated muscle weakness, the type of sports they do, and their overall posture. And just to consider drivers for abnormal muscle patterning may be centrally driven. So they may have developmental issues as a child, emotional factors such as bullying or any trauma that's going on emotionally, dysfunctional pain neuromodulation, altered sensory input causing reduced joint position sense and any psychological drivers. There's a fantastic article by Kathy Barrett in the um, Journal of Shoulder and Elbow, which I've put at the the, put the link at the end of this presentation for if you want to read further. Good evening, everyone. I, I'll just wait to see if there are any questions, but it has been a very informative talk. Thanks so much. Despite all the challenges that you had, uh, you made it, and <laughs> we are most happy that, you know, we had the pleasure of listening to you live. I mean, you. that nothing beats that. Yeah, no, nothing you. beats that. Yeah, so it was a very informative talk on shoulder instability. We came to know the polar type 1, type 2, type 3. Not only the assessment part, but even the treatment part. I mean, of course, it was a rushed uh, talk because I can understand there was a constraint of time, I guess. Each type could kind of take maybe, you know, two, three hours to just understand what is the assessment behind it and what would be the management for such conditions. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting to know about the overactivity of the pectorals and the lats, which need to be looked into, especially for the type two and type three and how we need to kind of engage not only the rotator cuff, but the core in most mm -hmm. of the strengthening and retraining programs. So all in all, it has been a wonderful uh, experience. I'll just uh, look if there are any questions from the audience and uh, uh, could Dr. Nikita be guiding us for that? Uh, you have muted, I mean, you may need to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Nanit, ma'am. So it was a really inquisitive talk. Uh, so we don't find any questions as of now, but I guess we can wrap up.